All right, good evening. Um, pleasure to be here. Thanks to uh, REAP for inviting us. Um, and thanks, Levi. I think uh, you did a terrific job kind of introducing um, why we're in this field. And then certainly um, uh, what I want to kind of convey is what we're up to now over the last uh, couple years in advancing our technologies. So a little bit of background on ORPC. I think a lot of folks in the room know about ORPC. We were founded in 2004. We have approximately 30 employees. We're headquartered in Portland, Maine. Um, so both myself and my colleague Carrie, who's here as well, um, work out of the Portland office. Um, we also have offices in uh, Montreal, Canada, and Dublin, Ireland. Um, and we do have staff in Alaska as well. Um, our company is founded around our core technology that, that Levi explained, our cross-flow technology. Um, and in addition to that, I would say that um, we have a very, very strong development team. So coupled with our technology development, we have staff that really are responsible for making sure we get the, the technology in the water in ways that are environmentally, economically, and socially appropriate for the sites. And we do that by really developing very strong relationships with the communities that we work with, um, where, in fact, the, these are their projects where we work uh, as much as ours. Um, and they're as much a part of the success, if not more, um, as us. Um, we recognize, uh, as uh, Levi really explained very well, um, there's a significant market in Alaska. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail about our focus. But we see very similar markets as well in northern Canada and southern Chile and Patagonia um, related to the diesel high cost um, markets. So a bit of background on some of the work that we have done in uh, Alaska. Um, You've heard a lot about the Igiagu project, um, which is here. Um, but we've done previous work um, on the tidal energy side, both in Nikiski and Anchorage. Uh, we have a project in False Pass that I'll uh, explain a little bit further, um, as well as some early testing on, in Nanana. Um, the Kodiak and Yucatan are both actually um, projects that our development team were involved with. Kodiak um, with uh, actually Levi's team in deploying that uh, wave energy or wave measurement buoy. And Yucatan, actually, we worked on some permitting for that uh, Resolute Marine um, wave energy device. Um, so a, a big, big uh, footprint, uh, none of that would be possible without some great partners, uh, both on the state and federal level for funding, um, as well as other partners within the state that have really been uh, a big part of our success. Um, the market. Uh, so this is really the driver for us, and I think it really builds off what Levi was talking about. Um, there's over 700 million people in the world um, that use diesel generation for their source of power. In Alaska, that's uh, 78,000 people um, and over 27 million gallons of uh, diesel that get burned annually. Um, that results, especially in a lot of these very remote locations, to very high cost of power. Um, a lot of these communities are indigenous communities. Um, and then, as Levi showed, most of them are located on some sort of uh, water resource, whether it's a river tidal resource or wave resource. Um, and that results in these islanded grids. Um, and um, because of those combined conditions, we're really focusing on this market. So I'm going to spend some time talking about Ig Igiagi today in a little bit more detail. Um, my former colleague, Monty, um, spoke to this group, uh, REAP group, about a year ago in October and teed up this project. So I thought it would be really helpful to kind of uh, give you an update on where we've been um, since that time and uh, give you some real highlights of uh, how this came together over the course of this year. Um, so again, Igiag is a community. Uh, it's about 250 miles southwest of Anchorage. Uh, amazing community with amazing leadership and amazing vision. Um, in addition to recognizing the need for more sustainable um, energy solutions, um, they're also looking at other innovative ways to really sustain their community. Um, great leadership. Um, this, uh, this community is actually located on one of the highest concentrations of sockeye salmon in, in the world. Um, and so that's something that we work very closely with them because of the importance both to subsistence as well as um, commercial fishing in the Bristol Bay area. Um, so I'm going to talk kind of about the journey of our device, our RivGen device. Um, this is uh, an iteration of our device. We actually deployed um, previous generations in Igiagig in 2014 and 2015, which really a lot informed this latest design, which is a modular system really intended to use minimal equipment so that it can be shipped and uh, deployed using local assets. 
So uh, this picture actually shows uh, Governor Janet Mills um, in Maine. Um, as I said, we're based in Maine, and uh, we actually assembled the unit um, in a hangar at the former Brunswick Naval uh, Air Station uh, in, over the course of the winter. So dry fit everything. The components came from a number of different places. Uh, we tried to build as uh, locally as possible the, the structure that we call the pontoon support structure. Uh, was actually built uh, in Maine, as well as all the other structural components. The generator itself um, uh, comes from a Norwegian company. Um, this figure doesn't show the mechanical brake, but that actually comes uh, is a British company. And the turbines themselves um, are, were built in Ireland, um, and they were shipped directly to Iggy uh, This shows a few more pictures of assembling the device. Um, inside in Maine, even though it's uh, nice and inside. Uh, in the winter time, it was still kind of chilly in that hangar, um, and uh, so guys were bundled up. Um, in fact, this is one of our employees from Alaska um, who was in Maine for the winter to, that, to help with the assembly. Um, um, and then once that was, uh, we went through, integrated everything, it was um, broken down, shipped by flatbread trailer across the U.S. Um, and uh, then by barge across Cook Inlet, um, over the pass to Lake, Lake Eliamna, um, and then on the barge here, um, arriving in, in Igiagi. Um, I think you can see, it doesn't show up too well here on the chart, but uh, this is Cook Inlet here, um, and uh, it was actually shipped across Williamsport um, to Lake Eliamna. Um, at the same time, I, I really want to highlight, um, I think a lot of folks in the room recognize that, uh, the importance of this. Um, we uh, were able to secure the FERC license on behalf of the Igyag Village. They're actually the license holder. Um, and uh, this is a significant deal. It was the, the uh, first FERC license for a hydrokinetic device that's actually being held by a tribal entity. Um, and then once operational, this is actually the first operational river hydrokinetic unit in the U.S. Um, uh, under a FERC license. Um, and in addition to FERC, we had all these other federal, state, and local permits that were requir required as well. Um, and uh, Carrie, who's in the back of the room there, was really instrumental um, in making sure we achieved these uh, goals, um, very significant goals. Uh, this is a 10-year pilot license for the Iggy Aga project. A um, little bit more lay of the land um, in Iggy Aga, so um, this is the main village here. Um, this is actually uh, uh, showing our rib gen device on shore where it was assembled when all the components got there. Um, and then this is the mouth um, to the Quijack River that uh, winds down here. The project site is actually just um, past this small uh, island. And then the power comes to shore um, and gets integrated into the, the local grid. Uh, this is a picture of some of the reassembly in Igiagig. Again, um, the, the device is designed to be modular so that um, all the components can be lift, lifted using just local assets, um, which is really important, uh, not only for Igiagig, but also for, um, for a number of other communities like Igiagig in Alaska or elsewhere. Um, most of this integration assembly um, occurred within the course of about two weeks, um, late, late June and early July. Um, and again, highlighting the local equipment. Um, this is a, a salmon vessel, a um, Bristol Bay vessel that they have in Igiagig that was used for most of, uh, most of the sh uh, pushing the device around. Local vessels using for uh, support and safety vessels, um, and then uh, the on onshore equipment as well. Um, this is a picture showing the deployment of the Dragon Bedman anchor. This is actually a, a Norwegian Vryhoff anchor. Previously on our deployments, we had used some custom anchors, um, two, two anchors. Um, we went for this down to a single Dragon Bedman anchor that's bridled back to the device. I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, and then this is actually launching the device into Lake Iliamna. Um, once it was in Lake Iliamna, we take um, testing and safety very, very importantly. So we did a number of tests making sure that uh, this device could be pushed by the vessel with adequate speed that it can be controlled going down the, uh, the river, but also um, submerging the device and bringing back to the surface, making sure that all elements of uh, the system worked well. Um, and then on the shore, um, 
This is uh, the deployment site. If, you're, if this, uh, this photo extended to the left is right down, downstream of this um, <coughs> point here. This is the shore station, so it's a modular system. Um, it's actually it's the same shore station that we had used previously, so that houses all the equipment from going from the turbine device into the local grid. Um, and again, it's using an existing gravel um, road there. Um, and then the, the device itself was uh, moved from the lake to the deployment location. This shows that um, vessel um, actually going downstream with the device, controlling it. Um, the way that this is designed is it floats on the surface using the pontoons. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I think, the same photo that Levi had shown. Um, this is once it actually gets hooked up to that anchoring system that I showed. So um, this current is roughly two meters per second consistently. And, uh, and so it's, again, taking safety into account. Um, we're very cautious about making sure we work safely uh, for our crew and the local crews. Um, once on site, um, final maintenance check. Um, and then we install it. So um, the way this works on the installation is those pontoons are um, ballasted, um, actually one side at a time, and I'll show you a quick video of what that looks like. Um, and then it uh, sits on the riverbed completely out of sight, below the surface, um, below the draft of local vessels. Um, and again, I want to highlight, um, you know, these are uh, local uh, folks from Igiag that were absolutely instrumental in, in all these activities. Um, you know, some of the the best trained folks globally in the industry are actually located in Igiagig. Um, they do tremendous work. Um, so here's a quick video um, showing the device on station. Um, this is uh, a barge that was used to uh, uh, house the cable uh, as the cable was brought to shore. Um, and then this shows uh, the device actually being installed and submerged. That process takes uh, roughly about an hour and a half to submerge the device. Um, and it's about the same um, uh, when we bring it back to the surface. Uh, that's an aerial photo from a plane um, showing the fully submerged device. On the surface there are just uh, some surface marking buoys for navigation, both downstream of the device as well. This is the anchor here. Um, um, so uh, this is just the first step um, in this project. That device. Um, actually will be in the water all winter. The intent is to operate that um, annually um, throughout um, all seasons. Um, we've done work to characterize the ice conditions um, in that river to understand the surface ice when it breaks up in Lake Iliamna. Um, and we'll do some additional on uh, device monitoring this winter as well um, to really characterize that. So the intent is that for this device to operate 12 months a year um, consistently. Um, and it's uh, really unique when it comes in terms of renewable energy because it's a base load source, um, consistently sending power to the local grid. The next step for us um, is really to um, integrate smart grid controls, energy storage, and a second device, which will allow the, the community to reduce their diesel use by 90% and really regulate that, those existing diesel generators to backup only. Um, and uh, we were very pleased working on behalf of the village council um, that we uh, uh, were awarded um, just this year uh, through the DOE Indian Energy Program, which is different than the Water Power uh, Office, uh, funding to do this phase two of this project. So that's very significant. Um, and uh, it's very much aligned um, with what Levi was talking about in terms of resilient communities. And that was really the program that DOE. Uh, Indian Energy was really um, interested in. Um, and getting a little bit more into details on that, um, this is kind of <clears throat> the model that we see that's replicable from uh, the Igiag microgrid. Um, <clears throat> we see this as baseload renewable energy um, that has, uh, will result in significant decreases, not only in diesel use, but CO2 emissions, O&M costs from their existing and environmental risk. I mentioned that this community is actually located on the highest concentrations of sockeye salmon, and they fly in diesels, uh, diesel to the community, which is a huge risk to that resource. Um, out of sight, no noise, um, lots of uh, advantages to that. Um, this sch schematic kind of shows how this works as an ecosystem where um, we think our technology can act as a base load 
that enables other technologies, other renewables to come on to that system, um, and also make sure that, um, that the critical um, infrastructure are supplied by the power. Um, we're also working with the community on a lease structure so that we can offer them, as well as other communities, um, this solution uh, at or, or below what they're currently paying um, in instead of coming up with the capital costs up front. So that same model is something that we're looking at for tidal environments and, and false pass I'm going to talk about briefly. Um, Levi mentioned false pass. It's, uh, it's in a community that has an incredible resource. Um, we've actually done work there characterizing that resource and it's one of the best that we've ever seen anywhere. Um, they do have high cost of power, not as high as uh, Igiagig. Igiagig is almost closer to a dollar kilowatt hour. Um, false pass is uh, closer to 40 cents. Um, so this is, uh, this is a community we're very interested in. Um, and just recently, um, this year, and we're just kicking this off right now, um, we were awarded a uh, SBIR, a Small Business Innovation uh, Research Grant for False Pass. Um, and I'm going to talk a briefly about what that entails. So <clears throat> what that really is to look at is, again, the, a community scale microgrid like we've done for Iggy Agi, but incorporating tidal energy into that system. Tidal is a little bit different. Um, there's a, uh, unlike river energy, it's, uh, it's intermittent, but it's completely predictable. So um, this resource is, again, a, a significant resource. When you couple that with energy storage, you can create a base load energy source. And that's really the intent of this um, phase one. Phase one of any SBR is really focused on feasibility. So it'll enable us to, to look at that tidal resource we're actually going to be deploying some instrumentation on um, their power system to really monitor uh, and get a better idea of their energy usage. And then based on that, look at um, the economics of integrating a, a, a grid around tidal energy with the intent, hopefully, uh, to proceed and ultimately um, deploy a turbine there. So what's next for us? Um, you know, we're really looking at um, using what we've done in Iggy Agig and what we continue to do in Iggy Agig to uh, identify other communities in, uh, in Alaska and around the world um, where we can deploy our technology. So a lot of our focus, especially on the development side, is looking for those opportunities, looking for that market where we can really make significant contributions, uh, again, not only in the economics but in the social and environmental benefits that can result from our technology. Um, and really start engaging with those customers to build relationships, which takes time, um, and really um, using, again, that Iggy Agg project um, as, as a terrific model. Um, these photos are actually for, from some of the site work we did um, over uh, the course of the summer, uh, August time frame, up on the Yukon River, looking at other communities there um, that uh, might be uh, interested in this type of technology. So with that, um, again, really appreciate your time and interest and would be happy to uh, um, answer any questions. So um, it's a good question. So uh, in Igiagig, the, um, well, I'll start with your second one. This is the first winter um, that we'll be going through, so we haven't gone through the breakup yet. Um, however, we deployed um, instrumentation called shallow water ice profiler to look at the depth of the ice that comes out um, of Lake Iliamna in that deployment area. And um, the, what we have measured um, is less than the draft of, over the device. So over that device is about four and a half feet of water. Um, and we saw that the ice itself um, coming out is only a, a foot or two. Um, it's a bit of a unique situation in Alaska, in Igiagig. It's a great first mover, early adopter site for several reasons, one of them being ice. Um, it's a clear river environment. Um, there's very low silt, but also the site itself doesn't freeze over. Um, the ice that comes down is when Lake Iliamna breaks up. And so that's, um, we have a pretty good understanding of that, um, not only from our partners in the community, but also by deploying instrumentation to understand that. And we, we have done that <coughs> over the last couple of years to, to, to get to that question, because it's a very valid question. You know, a lot of these technology projects that we see coming coming around to Alaska, there's a long period of development, like an mm -hmm. emerging technology. So I'm kind of uh, curious to hear about kind of what kind of a business model do you have to employ? I know it's partly 
funded by, by these different grants yep. and community efforts, but uh, you have to have some outside resource to maintain this long period of funding to be able to develop a technology to get where you want to go? It's a great question, um, and uh, it's not easy. Um, uh, you know, when we, uh, there was a question about burden, and you know, it takes a long time um, to develop, not only develop the technology, but to go through the permitting and licensing process uh, as well. Um, so we've been very successful um, in leveraging um, and combining private and public capital. Um, that's part of it. Um, and uh, the other way that we look at this is we um, look at that, um, what we call our LCOE reduction curve that Levi showed for wind, and use that as a way to determine where the early adopter markets are versus the next markets and the next markets. And as you bring your cost of your technology down, the markets become bigger and bigger. Um, and so uh, these high cost markets for us, we've really identified as those early adopter early mover projects. Um, and what we are, as a company, which is very exciting for us, is, is <clears throat> we feel like we're in the transition from research and development to sales and service. Um, and once you start getting sales, then you can kind of wean yourself off of um, the, uh, the other government support and use it just for continued improvements to technology. And so there is a transition. It takes a very long time. Um, and uh, you know, it was the same way in the wind. It was the same way in solar. Um, but we think by looking at their um, cost reductions um, that we can um, do that um, as, as quickly or quicker than they are learning lessons from you know, their improvements as well. This goes back to Cook, Cook Inlet and, and, and the high tidal areas. Um, I was uh, advised that uh, you know, like if you have an array in the water that they can only be spaced so far apart because of the turbulence. And so it's kind of like one of these um, Oklahoma uh, land, land rushes, you know, gold rushes to get the technology in there and, and secure your space mm. to, to be able to grab a certain kind of market share you know, that meets your needs to make it um, economic. Could you kind of address that kind yeah, of two-part sure. question? Yeah, um, so early on in the industry, I'm trying to think, um, 10 years ago probably, there was a gold rush on permits. Um, the, um, and those are FERC preliminary permits for our industry. And um, what folks quickly found is the technology wasn't um, uh, advancing quick enough to keep up with those permits, because those permits actually require pretty stringent um, reporting requirements and demonstration of progress towards a license um, and license submittal. Um, so unless you're really advancing um, on your understanding of, there's a number of different criteria, site conditions, resource, working with communities, um, then FERC will, you know, they, they, uh, they are pretty stringent on actually canceling those permits. Um, and enough time has elapsed um, that uh, a number of those permits, there's far, far fewer preliminary firm permits than there are uh, today than there were previously. Um, in regards to um, the array, that's, um, those are considerations um, that we have. We actually have measured our, the wake effects of our device. Um, and we'll use that as well as other um, criteria to determine the appropriate spacing um, of devices. Um, when we look at tidal environments as well and kind of scaling up, um, we actually look at, because our systems are modular, uh, we're, we're actually looking at stacking devices as well. So not only can we um, extend the width, but actually extend the, uh, the height of the systems. And we have previously deployed a kind of a utility scale larger system in Maine. Um, we're working on the next generation of that um, and have really learned a lot over the years um, in terms of different anchoring technologies, how to deploy. We're actually looking mostly at um, systems that have what we call our buoyant tension mooring system, so devices that are moored within the water column, still completely submerged, um, and using that type of system to scale up in the tidal environment. Questions, please. Um, this type of uh, device that you have in the Yuyag, can you envision that being expanded to the point where it would uh, be able to power an area the size of Anchorage or the Matsu Valley? And also, those blades, do you worry about belugas getting tangled up in them? I, I know fish could probably go sure. through them pretty easily. Yeah. Um, 
So I'll start with the second question. Um, we actually refer to them as foils, not blades, um, for some of the optics, but um, because they're actually, they are designed after um, airplane foils. They have a NACA profile, and, um, and uh, we've done uh, a significant amount of studies, um, environmental studies, um, both for marine mammals as well as for um, fish. Uh, when we deployed in Negiagi in 2015, it was actually while the sockeye salmon uh, adult run was still happening, and over a million and a half sockeye salmon passed that device going to Lake Iliamna, um, and we did not see, and we have video monitoring systems uh, working with uh, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, didn't see a single uh, evidence of injury and mortality to a single fish. Um, so um, that doesn't mean there's not no risk, or any risk, but, um, but uh, we think it's pretty minimal. And um, the system that we've deployed this year um, is, uh, also has monitoring systems on it, um, video monitoring systems uh, for that purpose as well. Um, so um, we, we're pretty confident. Beluga are very extremely rare in Nigiagi. Um It's about 60 miles up from Bristol Bay. Um, and uh, that is certainly more of a concern in Cook Inlet, um, Beluga, especially the distinct population um, uh, segment. Um, and that actually has been, as we have looked at opportunities in Cook Inlet, um, have been, was one of the reasons why we're concentrating more around East Foreland than up near Fire Island because of the presence of Beluga. Um, no indications that um, there would be negative uh, um, uh, interactions. But, um, but there certainly is more scrutiny around uh, when there's an endangered species, for sure. Um, and then your first question was on scaling up to provide power to much larger um, uh, customers. Um, we do think that uh, our devices are scalable. Um, that will take some time um, to uh, get that technology to that point. Um, as I said, we are working on tidal power systems as well. Um, and then the other consideration, I think, for whether it's Anchorage uh, or other, you know, larger utilities is making sure that that um, technology is introduced at a point on the cost curve um, that is appropriate. Um, so, you know, our, the early adopter markets are extremely high cost, and it's really identifying, you know, when we can compete economically. Um, and we think that, that um, that's absolutely possible. Um, it's just a little bit further out than the remote communities. Can I add a follow-up question there? C sure. Could you, and, and maybe curious to hear Levi chime in on this, just like I ideal scenario, um, what, like, what, what's the time frame? Like what steps need to happen for it to be kind of utility scale from each of your perspectives? Um, and like, yeah, like what's the next, testing ground that you need to hit and, and what are some like kind of major milestones from your perspective and then from a re research perspective as well. Okay. Um, and, like, and like explicit time, like are we talking decades? Are we talking, you know, what, what kind of time sure. frame? Um, I think that um, from a research perspective, starting now um, and trying to understand that there's, there's really both the, 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 the resource site characterization work and then the economics. Um, and both those things need to align in order to deploy devices. Um, so the work that Levi is doing now is essential to really understand. Um, Cook Inlet, as some folks have kind of alluded to, is a complicated system. Um, and so trying to understand that system in more detail is gonna allow companies like ORPC or other companies to understand um, you know, what is appropriate, what, where, where their technology is and when it's gonna be appropriate. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions around um, you know, the seabed geology, um, you know, uh, that is one of the biggest challenges in the industry is um, there's no one, one size fits all when it comes to anchoring technologies um, for these environments. And uh, as a geologist, I'll say that I've been kind of surprised. You would think that a lot of these environments would be scoured bedrock or, or um, something like that because of the high velocities. But there's an incredible range of different um, seabed geologies in, in these locations. So uh, in some applications, gravity anchors may work. In others, it could be suction caissons or screw anchors or, or other types of technologies. And, and uh, so there's a, there's a lot of different things to consider, as well as turbidity and, and other things that, uh, that Levi's working on. And then on the economic side, um, you know, again, it's, it's a matter of um, growing to scale. So, and that's one of our, you know, um, initiatives is to really um, work uh, uh, with the RivGen product and getting that out to communities 
and growing to scale and bring those costs down because that will be directly related to um, our tidal technology as well. Um, and then in time frame, you know, I think that uh, um, certainly not decades. Um, I would say, um, you know, considering also that there's a fairly lengthy permitting and licensing process, um, that I would say in a five to ten year time frame. Yeah, I, I think I would just echo everything he said. Um, the I was I was also thinking about just the research that needs to be done on the site and and the geology. I mean, one of the things um, ac this was actually a um, uh, a bathymetry survey that uh, ORPC conducted was that in 2012, um, and and we actually recently purchased that data and we're putting it into the public domain now and and it shows that there are these large sand dunes sort of just up uh, up the inlet from the the foreland and and you can actually when you sort of take blur your eyes or, or take a bird's eye view you can see how as the tide rips around that corner and you get these eddies it deposits the sand um, uh, on that upstream side um, but it is it is away from the from the channel where the where the energy is most intense but it does raise this question of if you start to slow the flow down in that site, are you going to see sediment de deposition in there that's going to be a problem for you? And I, I, I think we can, and, and so the um, sediment measurements that we're going to be making now to characterize what are the sediments that are in the channel are sort of a first step at us being able to say, okay, these are the sizes of the sizes and the mass properties of these sediments. Now let's run simulations where, where we put turbines into these sites and see if that sediment accumulates. So those are the sorts of things that we're starting to, trying to grapple with. But you know, I don't think that, again, I think it's a, these are technical challenges that we can solve. For example, maybe that means that you're going to use a floating technology rather than something that's anchored on the bottom, or you know, who knows what. But um, uh, And then as far as timeline, yeah, it's about scaling up. Um, I think I think we can do it in ten years if we if we make the commitment to do it, um, and it, it's a you know it's about finding I, I, it's it's a chicken and the egg thing uh, at some point and um, I I think it's about let's do it. <laughs> yeah, and I'd also say it, it's happening, uh, and I think Igiagig yeah. is um, yeah, kind of exactly. uh, a good model for that. It's. It's 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 not uh, it's happening, um, and it it uh, might be happening slowly, but um, every uh, every progressive step is going to be um, really important to moving the industry to that bigger scale. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's a really exciting time in the industry, not only for us, but there are other projects uh, happening um, in the U.S. Uh, both on the tidal and the wave energy front um, that. Um, that I think over the next couple of years will bring further um, awareness to the industry and, uh, and with that hopefully bring a lot of other, uh, more momentum. Yeah, and, and I mean the Europeans have, you know, they have scaled it up to somewhat larger scales than us. Um, you know, we could take that uh, as a model or, you know, develop partnerships. Um, uh, you know, I think all this is to be, to be charted. Uh, Fire Island has about 80 megawatts worth of wind sites left out there, <clears throat> and their last proffer was 6.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Do you think that because of you have a more predictable uh, production pattern that you ought to be given a premium? What is it, and when will you reach it? Yeah, I don't have the answer to that because we haven't um, have anything negotiated for that. Um, certainly, we think that there's, um, and when it comes to capacity factor, um, there's advantage of, of tidal um, over wind. Um, it's that's not discouraging wind, but um, you know I think that there's advantages of that. Um, certainly, the predictability, as you noted, um, uh, is really important as well. 
Um, you know, there's ever, even been some folks um, we haven't explored it too much, but have taught that have talked about the sequencing tidal energy over the course of Cook Inlet. You can actually um, pretty much create a base load energy source, um, and so that in that sense, the capacity factor overall in the Cook Inlet would be very high. So I think there's advantages of that. We're not to the point where we've negotiated a PPA or anything like that, um, but. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot to be learned probably from the Fire Island project. Um, can I, if I can add to sure. that? Sure. Um, the, um, the National Renewable Energy Lab and the Pacific Northwest National Lab, um, we have a MHK, what we call an MHK grid value project where we're actually trying to quantify the value of the predictability of uh, tidal energy um, in terms of like, you know, if, if you can rely on tidal energy you know, if you build a tidal energy project that this, that, that, that's this big and you know it's going to be available, maybe that's that um, the capacity of that uh, project is a half or two-thirds of what an equivalent wind project would be. And so you can actually start to quantify what, what the value of that predictability is. Or maybe you, you, there's less batteries that you have to build into your system. Um, and so quantifying it at sort of those macroeconomic scales is something that we're looking at. Um, yeah, and I had something else to say, but I forgot what it was. I had a question about, uh, you said that you worked with the university to film the sockeye run as you had a device in the water. Did the fish actually <laughs> swim right through the blades of it? Um, the, uh, no, um, for the most part, well, yes and no. Um, so uh, we've actually done a lot of work as well with fish um, in Maine um, that's been published work as well. Um, and uh, what we've tended to, to see from most of the data is that smaller fish go right through the turbine without any adverse effects, without actually hitting the, the foils. Um, and uh, the larger the fish, the greater the distance they start taking avoidance. Um, and uh, one of the good things about the technology is that fish, you know, have developed over millennium the ability to avoid um, structure in the water, and so they tend to just avoid it. Um, in the case of sockeye, um, they uh, this kind of gets to pr appropriate sighting of the turbines. Um, the sockeye tend to go up the banks um, because they're going upstream. They don't want to fight against the the high velocity area. So by just where we are located within the river stream avoids a lot of the interaction. Um, we did see some interaction with sockeye where they would approach the device and then just swim away. Um, we did see some smolt, um, other salmonoid smolt that went right through it, schools of smolt, um, with no noticeable adverse interaction downstream. Okay, thank you. I have another follow-up question. I know that there's a lot of uh, debate, I guess, on the sediment transfer, the debris transfer, and how to mitigate that. And I go back to, there's a lot of oil and gas development that's already taken place over the years. Uh, the North Seas have developed a lot of different technology, and that can all be integrated into the ocean energy projects also, I would think. And how much do we utilize that existing technology and tackle some of these engineering problems? Um, that's a very good question. So there's, there is a lot to be learned from um, other industries. Um, I mentioned some of the, you know, the anchoring technologies. There's, um, there's a lot of anchored um, oil platforms and other things that, that uh, um, the biggest challenge we've seen is that uh, the costs associated with oil and gas technologies and deployment are way outside of the uh, early budgets of the technologies that are involved in the MHK space. Um, so um, whether that's good or not, I think it actually leads to a lot of innovation um, within the space. And so we've done a lot of innovating um, that I think uh, a lot of lessons learned, but also a lot of innovation on how to do things um, in these very, very challenging environments, but how to do them cost effectively. Um, and so, yeah, I agree that th there's absolutely a lot that can be learned, um, but it seems like the, the costs are uh, old, prohibitive a lot of the time and in the early stage of the, the industry. 
So I think we have time for just one more question here. Thank you. Um, this is perhaps a parochial question, but um, down in Homer, um, there's the, I don't know, Riv Gen 1 maybe, or something that came out of the Igigik River, or the Kvijak River. Um, it was just kind of sitting there. I was curious, I mean, one, what what's gonna happen with it? I don't know if it's still there or not, if somebody's taken it away. Um, but And then a lot of questions came up, and, and so they were trying to find out well, what happened with it. I mean, it was sort of put in the river and then taken out of the river, and I guess taken apart or something, and not going to be used again. Um, I assume that was your second Riv Gen 2 right. um, out there. So I was just curious if you could touch on what what happened with the first experiment, how it obviously didn't go really well. Um, so I'm just curious what... Uh, sure. Um, well, I would actually consider that project is incredibly successful. Um, and But I, that was, a, again, a DOE-funded project, so these have project lifelines, life, uh, lifetimes. Um, so that was the end of the project. Um, you know, you kind of have set milestones to go through. Um, I'm actually not exactly sure of the status of those components in Homer. Um, I know that uh, one of the turbines was actually brought up here to the museum last year um, and was on display um, at the museum, um, which we were pretty proud of. Um, the other components, um, I think, are mostly the steel structure um, that remains. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we, um, we're actually working through the process with DOE now on um, because we anticipate that the device that we've got deployed now will be useful for the course of the FERC license, it's full 10 years of working through them on the disposition of the equipment, which actually is something that they're not familiar with and have not done much of. So we're working through that process with them. But that is, um, that is uh, something you know we should probably look into further, but is also kind of part of the um, funded project process as well. But I, I'm glad you brought it up because I'll, I'll look into that. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for making it out this evening. Let's give a big round of applause for Levi and Nathan. <laughs> and, yeah, stay tuned for our spring uh, speaker series. We'll be releasing that information shortly. So thanks.